Hi, welcome to another episode of Dig Deeper. Uh, as you might know, we started Dig Deeper because during quarantine and we were all closed down, we couldn't interact with the public, and that is one of our main goals here at Jamestown Rediscovery. So we started the video series to get the message out and talk to people and interact, and it's become such a big deal for all of us that despite the fact that we're now open, we've decided to keep doing it. So we're going to dedicate this entire video to just answering questions that we got on our past videos so we can dig even deeper. I'm going to hand it off to our other archaeologists here. So we got a question from Daniel Appleton, and he's asking, how has the coronavirus affected your work, or has it had much of a significant effect on progress? Uh, and that's a great question. So it was definitely affecting our excavations um, more towards the outbreak of the pandemic back in March. Uh, so we did have to take a pause from our excavations, and we were all working uh, from home for about three months. But that gave us an opportunity to actually go back uh, and you know, begin writing reports, doing a whole lot of research, uh, and taking a look at the field notes that we've been taking for the past couple of years. Um, so it was actually a good opportunity to review what we needed to. Uh, and then around May, we were able to actually get back out onto the island and continue our excavations. Um, and we are obviously taking precautions. We have our masks, uh, washing our hands more often. We're trying to stay out of parts of the building that we don't need to be in. So we're still trying to uh, stay separate, um, but we were able to be back out here and digging. So it's not, uh, it's not hurting our progress too much right now. Okay, this is an answer to Fizza O about the Hertfordshire Church in England that is uh, circa 1615. And the question was, does the church in Hertfordshire relate to the church here that was built in 1617? And I think the answer is that it all depends on context and materials. So our church, which is roughly in a, within a couple of years of their church, which uh, apparently is brick, uh, here we had plenty of material in the new world of lumber. That's one of the things the English write about, the colonists write about, and then employed in their building uh, of built, uh, structures like the, the church and uh, some of the other row houses here. Later on, as the church, the brick church here behind me represents, uh, in 1639, they employed a brick construction in, uh, in, in the colonies here. And I think that's more the, the uh, rule than the exception after a period. Um, I think that that's fantastic that we're able to look on the other side of the pond, as it were, to some of these structures. And we did spend a lot of time crawling through churches in England before we, we constructed this. And one in particular is interesting. It's stone and wood. It was the Langley Chapel in Shropshire, which is uh, basically what we represented this reconstruction on for our, our interpretation here at Jamestown. So thank you, Fizzo, for your question. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Chuck Durfer. Um, I'm here with a question from Mary Mathis, and she asked a question to talk a little bit about the mortar that is here and why are there two different colors. And also, would the modern mortar or plaster that's here be the same mixture as in the church now? So that's a great question. For the last three years, we've actually been working with the Federal Laboratory, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, to learn about the mortar and the plaster that's here. So let's talk a little bit about that, and that is that plaster is material largely made of lime putty with a little bit of inclusion, and it's usually put on the walls either as a way to make the inside of the building look nice or the outside to make it waterproof. Mortar, on the other hand, has usually a lot more sand or gravel added, and it's used to keep bricks together. So just defining those terms. So in terms of your question, different colors, we found that the brick church that was built here was started in 1639, and that particular mortar is very uh, tan, well, tan. It's more grayish in color, and it had a much higher lime putty content than the mortar used in the 1647 part of the church, and that's because they ran out of money during the building of the church. They stopped for a while. They came back. They got enough money to finish the church, 
and the darker color of the mortar, the, the brown color of that mortar, is due to a higher sand content, even though the rest of the composition is about the same. So the next question is, is the composition the same? Yes and no. Um, mortars today are often made from limestone, whereas the mortar here was made from oysters. But the lime product, the quick lime that's made in the slake lime, are pretty much the same. What's interesting in Jamestown, and it's fairly unique, I've talked to other people around the country about it, is that our mortar often has little bits of brick. And that actually goes back to a trick that the Romans used many, many years ago. Adding that brick fragment, or they used volcanic ash, it's called a pozzolanic material. It actually makes the mortar stronger. But it also puts a little bit of red material in your mortar. So mortar today doesn't use that. Mortar today, however, other materials have been invented since the time of Jamestown. One of them is Portland cement. And it is strong, it's, it's easy to use, but it has an inherent problem that the older mortars did not. Portland cement does not allow water to go through it. Whereas these mortars that are here are older and are actually more um, moisture permeable. And that was a problem for us. About five, six years ago, we actually had to take the Portland cement off the inside of this tower because the water was wicking up and destroying the tower. So the older folks, when they were making their plaster for buildings like this and worrying about water damage, they knew what they were doing. Thank you so much for a great question. Hi, uh, I have a question here from Mary G. Uh, Mary asks, do you have any idea who is buried in some of the graves that we've uncovered here at Jamestown? And are there any written documents that give an indication of who could be in a particular location? Uh, that's a really great question. And the answer to it is, we sometimes do have documents that might give an indication about who's buried on the island. Um, by and large, however, very few people who lived at Jamestown um, in the 1600s or 1700s are identified by name or have anything written about them. Uh, and that's because not everybody who is coming here uh, is literate. Uh, so they're not all keeping journals and the folks who are literate aren't necessarily writing down information about everybody living at Jamestown. Uh, Jamestown was kind of the Ellis Island of its day. A lot of people coming to Virginia came through here and a lot of people ended up being buried here. Now we've uncovered hundreds of burials here at Jamestown uh, in the 1617 churchyard where I'm standing now uh, on State House Ridge uh, underneath the uh, State House uh, and in scattered areas around the island. Uh, and of those we can identify the particular locations of very few individuals. Most of the burials here um, we know contain some sort of skeleton but we don't know who it is. That doesn't mean we can't uh, figure out something about that person's life by examining their skeleton. We, we can. Your skeleton holds a lot of information about your life, your journeys. Um, we can look at it and sometimes do some isotopic testing and tell where you were from, maybe what you did for a living, how you died, all sorts of things. But we probably won't be able to identify each individual out here by name because we just don't have all the documents. Now, most of the burials here get left alone. We identify their locations and then cover them back up to preserve them. We, we don't actually dig up all of the skeletons out here. That's because we treat our stewardship of the human remains on Jamestown Island very seriously. We want to make sure that unless there's a really compelling reason to examine a skeleton, the people who are buried here stay where they are. Thank you for your great question. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing some of the answers from our archaeological staff. And before we go, I really just want to address the most frequently commented thing that we get on all of our videos, which is thank you. We get so many comments, and believe me, we look at them, we see them that say thank you, great job, we love what you're doing, we, we see them, we appreciate them, and because of them, we are going to keep doing videos like this. So if you didn't see your question on this video, stay tuned for the next one. Thank you again so much, and keep those comments coming. <laughs>